Good morning. I hope that you will be blessed this morning by listening in to us this, today. I'd like to welcome you all who are listening, and if you're listening in for the first time, we hope that uh, you'll tune in again. Uh, before we go any further, let us uh, pause for a moment of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for the night rest You've given us to wake us up on another beautiful day. We ask, Lord, that You be with those who like to be here this morning but are hindered. We want to lift up those in our church that have suffered loss this week and those who are sick, feeble, want to lift all of them up. And Lord, we just ask right now that we will focus on worshiping you today and listening to your word, but not only listening to your word, but acting upon it. We ask that you speak to our hearts, challenge us here this morning. And Lord, we just ask all these in Jesus' name, amen. When I was a little boy, believe it or not, I was little at one time. I used to love to go to watch the Rohannon High School play football. This was many, many years ago. And a girl that I grew up with who lived this house between us, me and her would often walk together to the football field. And we would have a good time going down there talking about the game. And then as the game ended, we had to walk back home and it was dark. We was about 10, 11 years old. And we was okay because there was a few other folks walking home too. But as we turned up the road to go where we lived at, it was just me and her. And she suggested that we hold hands because we were both scared because on the way up to where we lived, there was a house that they claimed that was haunted. And when we would get right there at it, we would get very, very quiet. As a matter of fact, we never looked at the house when we got beside of it because we was afraid that we might see a ghost. But as we managed to get by that house, uh, she got to go to her house first. And then there was a house between us to get to mine and what I've always liked about it, when we got to her house, she always gave me a kiss. And then I would have to walk from her house to my house. And to me, that was probably the scariest part of the whole uh, night. I was by myself. But I became a pretty good whistler between her house and my father's house. But I could see him sitting there through the kitchen window there, drinking a cup of coffee, waiting on me to get home. And once I was able to see him, all fear seemed to, to go away. Because I knew if I was to holler, my father and my mother would be outside in a matter of seconds. We don't like uh, being afraid. If you've got a copy of God's Word with you, I would like for you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 14, verse 22. This is a familiar chapter here. Herod the Tetrarch had just had John the Baptist's head cut off, and he had heard about Jesus, and he thought Jesus was John the Baptist risen from the dead, so he he was very nervous. So this is a, a very familiar chapter if um, you read Matthew quite a bit. All right, let's begin looking here in verse number 22. And straight away, Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitude away. And when he had sent the multitude away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. 
And then the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. And when his disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and began to sink. He cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore doest thou doubt? And when they were come into the ship, the wind ceased. And they that were in the ship came and worshipped him and saying of a truth, thou art the son of God. Being afraid is a terrible experience to cope with. All of us from time to time have things that we are afraid of. Some may be having to speak in public. Uh, we, we have all kinds of fears that we have to cope with. Fear can affect us in so many ways. Fear can cause us to become physically ill. I've seen people that were so afraid, so scared, that they would literally become physically ill. I remember when I was at, at Fruitland, we had a preaching class, and the guy that taught the preaching class was a tremendous preacher, one of the best, if not the best, I've ever heard. And the guy that was before me that had to preach that day in our homiletics class got so nervous, so afraid that he couldn't preach. And Dr. Ridings told him, he said, Larry, just come back next week and be prepared. And then he looked over at me and he said, Brother Marie, you got a little longer than 15 minutes to preach now because that was the allotted time we had to preach. So we, we have all kind of fears and, uh, and it, it's a terrible thing that fear grabs a hold of us like it does. And I want to speak this morning when fear grabs a hold of us, what can we do? Fear is something that we all experience at different times. You are not exempt from being afraid. It doesn't matter how close you walk to the Lord. It doesn't matter how tough you think you are or how bad you think you are. Fear from time to time grabs a hold of it. You're not exempt from it. 20 or 30 years ago, you, you didn't think nothing about getting in your car at night and go to the shopping centers. You, you didn't even pay that no attention, but not anymore. You are very cautious, and getting out at night is not as safe as it used to be. It used to didn't bother me. I always felt like I could take care of myself. I, I just was not one of those that was scared of anybody. But now that I've gotten older, I've gotten slower. I don't move as quick as I used to. And now I'm more cautious than ever before. There is an element of fear out there now for all of us. And it's a terrible thing when we are afraid. Currently right now, America is under the grips of a pandemic. It has all of us living in a state of fear. You say it don't bother me. Oh, yes, it does. It does bother you because you're not as free as you used to be. If you go anywhere in a public place, you got to have a mask on. But all of us are under a state of fear. 
Now, I've listened to the doctors. I've listened to these scientists on TV. And I don't even know if they know what's going on. They tell us to wear a mask. Then they tell us not to. And now we tell us to be wearing them again. They've changed so many times. You don't know what to believe. And when you don't know what to believe and you know people are dying with it, it causes fear to come upon you. And as of currently that I know of, there's been over 360,000 people to die with this virus. You can't even shake hands no more. You can't even hug nobody no more. Now some of the men probably enjoys that. They don't have to hug their wives. But those that love to hear their, uh, hug their wives, it don't bother them. But fear has gripped all of us. You got to stand six feet apart. You got to practice social distancing. When that first came out, I said, hey, that's pretty good. So I made my wife go outside for six weeks. And then I invited her back into the house. Some are, uh, that we know, that are having after effects from this virus. There's people that's gotten over it, but they can't move like they used to. It's wore them down. And it may take weeks or months for them to get better. All of us know someone who has the virus, who has had the virus, and we know some that has died from the virus. One preacher friend of mine used to see him a lot at Walmart. He would come by, we would talk, and asked me how I was getting along, and right there in front of everybody, he would pray for me. He didn't, uh, it didn't bother him, and I'm, I was glad he was that way. He was not ashamed to pray for people in public. He comes down with the virus, and he fought a good battle, but he lost it. But he's rejoicing this morning because I know where he's at. I know one thing that this virus has done to me. It has enhanced my prayer life because I don't want to catch it myself. But let's look today in God's word and see some of, the, some of God's greatest saints and how they had to handle fear and what you and I can learn when fear grabs hold of us, what can we do? The apostle Peter had to deal with fear many times in his walk with the Lord. The Apostle Paul many times had to deal with fear. And we look at these men and we read about these men and we see how they handled it. Some didn't handle it too well. Some had to go through a lot before they began to handle these things. But how did they handle fear and try to walk with the Lord at the same time? First of all, this great apostle, I want us to look at how fear came after him. First of all, it seemed like fear seemed to have visited Peter at night. Now, if you notice anything about the Apostle Peter and the trials that he went through, most of them came at night. Now, folks, they, there's a reason for this. Some of us have our greatest fears at night. My mother used to dread sundown. She never did like it. She said, I hear things that I don't hear during the day. And she said, I'm here alone and I worry about it. She never liked nightfall. And most of us, if we be truthful, we probably don't like it either. You don't like to walk out in your yard at night when it's dark. You might stumble and fall or somebody might be out there waiting on you. You just don't know. But here, the Apostle Peter, at nighttime, it seemed to be when fear grabbed a hold of him. It was a night when the Lord told him, did you, he said, Peter, you will deny me three times. It was at night. The Bible says that. Listen to what it says here. Matthew 26, 34. 
Jesus said unto him, Most surely I say unto you that this night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. You, remember, you see that? It was at night. Now, just prior to that, oh, he, he was, oh, he was gun ho. He was right with the Lord. But you know, when fear grabbed a hold of him, I don't know him. Never met the man. So it was night when the Lord told him that you would deny me three times. It was also at night when fear told him uh, to follow him afar off. You remember the scriptures clearly says that Peter, after Jesus was arrested, it says and he followed him afar off. He was afraid. He was frightened. Every one of us gets that way from time to time. And, and it's a terrible thing when we in, in a crowd of somebody, when it's time that we can maybe witness for our Lord that we follow him afar off. You wouldn't even know we was a Christian. I've been in the grocery stores a many times meeting a lot of Christian people. And we'll be talking about the Lord. But you let a stranger walk up. And it went from talking loud to barely able to hear them. I don't understand that. I could see them beginning to be afraid to talk about the Lord around strangers. Well, that's the worst thing you could do to me. Because I got louder and louder and louder. I wanted people to know that I loved my Lord. And I wasn't ashamed of him. But on this night, at night again, Peter followed him afar off. It was at night when uh, he was identified as a follower by three people. Came upon him, see, you one of them, you one of them. I, I'm not, I don't even know the man, never seen him in my life. Fear made him blend in with the crowd. He blended in with them. He didn't want nobody to know he was a follower of Christ. So remember earlier, Lord, I, I'll die for you. But fear got a hold of him. And fear caused him to deny his Lord. And here's this story here. It was between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. when fear came upon Peter again. The fourth watch. That's the time of the fourth watch. Between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. And fear came upon him once again. But not only him, but the rest of those apostles. Now I'm going to have to say something to you. I'm going to, I'm going to have to take up for him a little bit. Have you ever seen anybody walk on water? I haven't. And here they were right there on this sea it was rough, the wind was blowing, the waves was up. <laughs> and all of a sudden, they see a figure right there. Now, considering that they've never seen nobody walk on water, I, too, probably would have said, that's a goose. So we got to give them a little break there. But as this ghost that they thought was getting closer and closer to them, they began to recognize who it was. And Peter said, Lord, if it's you, can I come and walk with you? And I want to tell you something, folks. I got to thinking about this. Why did Peter want to get out of the boat and be with Jesus? I would think it would be more uh, better to stay in the boat then he'd get out of the boat. But I'm going to tell you, he was so afraid that he felt like it was better to be with Jesus than be in that boat. Have you ever thought about that? You think about it. The boat was filling up. The waves was high. The wind was blowing. And there was Jesus. I doubt Jesus was even wet from all the stuff that was going on. And Peter said, God, it's got to be better to be with him to be in this boat. So he got out. 
And he walked to Jesus and he was doing fine. But I want to tell you something. Here comes fear again. The wind blew. And it frightened him. He took his eyes off Jesus and he began to go down in the water. But you know what he had done? He hollered out, save me, Lord. And Jesus takes care of his own, don't he? Did you know that if those disciples, those apostles would have drowned that night, his kingdom workers, he wouldn't have had any. That was all he had was right there in that boat. He could not let them drown because that was all he had. And by the way, Jesus takes care of his own. You remember he leaves the 99 sheep to themselves and he goes out looking for that other one. Jesus takes care of his own. And there was Peter going down in the water. And the Bible clearly says, and the hand, the hand reached out. And pulled him up. And they got into the boat together. And here's the other thing. Verse 33. They began to worship him. I would have too. I've been out there in the ocean. I've been out there way out in the ocean. 30 miles. And I've seen what that water can do. It's a scary thing. You can't drink all that water up and you sure can't swim 30 miles in that kind of water. But I knew that my Lord was with me. We came in and we was okay. I believe, Peter, that fear was something that would uh, at times come upon him. But Peter also found out that if he keeps his eyes on Christ that he'd be okay because he never forgot that night when the Savior's hand reached out and pulled him up out of the water. These great prophets of God in the Bible, you can go all through the Bible and, and, and read about these great prophets of God. Most of them was murdered. Isaiah was sawed in half. That's a terrible way to go, isn't it? We have countless stories of these great prophets of God who proclaim his word. Most of them ended in a tragic way. I'm going to tell you, being a preacher doesn't mean nothing's going to happen to you. Preachers have been shot for trying to spread the gospel. Missionaries had been eaten alive because of trying to spread the gospel. Spreading the gospel does not mean everything's going to be a bed of roses. Most of these prophets in the Old Testament died tragic death. But there was another one here in the Old Testament I want to look at. I like this guy. He was tough. His name was Elijah. Other than Moses, he's the second greatest prophet to the Hebrew people. And by the way, Elijah didn't die. He didn't die. But fear seemed to have visited Elijah after a great victory. Now I can relate to that. There's been times at churches that I've been there and I felt like this message that God had gave me, I said, man, I'm going to tell you, it ain't me. God's had to do this. And you give the invitation and nobody moved. You get in your car and you're still feeling good and down the road a little bit, you're attacked by the enemy. Fear comes upon you. And this was the case here. Here was Elijah, a powerful, powerful prophet. When Elijah came into the room, people stood up. People recognized who he was. He was God's man. But by this time, some of, the, some of God's children has, had gotten cold. 
But it seemed like fear uh, visited Elijah after a great, great victory. Fear wanted to take away quickly our victories when we have a victory. Fear comes in. If you look at your life, maybe you've been at church or maybe you've been at home and you made a recommitment to Christ. Maybe you realized that your life was not what it's supposed to be and it's been bothering you. And you knelt down somewhere and said, Lord, I rededicate my life. And within 30 minutes, you are attacked. Fear comes over you. You've just recommitted your life. And now fear has come upon you. That's usually how it works, folks. When we have a victory, it seems like it's just in a matter of minutes, fear comes in. I think of mother, uh, the mother of Jesus, Mary. Gabriel visit her. How many of you have had a visit from him? Not many. And he tells this young girl that she was going to have a baby and he was going to be the savior of the world. And she's sort of puzzled about this. She said, how can this be? I don't know a man. And he begins to explain to her. And I believe after he began to explain to her, a peace, a calm came over here. Why me? Why will I carry the Savior of the world? What a blessing. But you know something? Mary had to go home. She had to go back home to where she was living at. And she had two parents, her mother and her father, and she said, I got some wonderful news. I'm pregnant, and I hadn't been with a man. Ho, 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 ho. Can you imagine that conversation? Can you imagine her trying to explain that to her folks? I can look at Mary's father said, uh, let's get her an appointment tomorrow at the mental hospital. She needs help. Don't she know by now that you just don't get pregnant? But you know, Mary had won a victory a little earlier. She had a visit from Gabriel. He assured her everything was going to be all right. You know, it's sort of strange that nothing is said about her parents. Nothing. And it's sort of strange not too long after that, she has to go see her, uh, her cousin Elizabeth. Fear began to take over quickly after her victory. And there was David. King David. As a little lad, he kills this giant called Goliath. He kills him with a slingshot. And he begins to come into the city, and the women adore him. They was out in the street hollering, Saul has killed his thousands, but David his tens of thousands. There was David riding high in the saddle. Everything was okay. And there's a passage of scripture in 1 Samuel verse, uh, chapter 18, verse 9. I'm going to read it here. Now, here was King Saul sitting up there watching all this taking place, hearing what they were saying. And the Bible says, so Saul eyed David from that day forward. I'm going to get him. I'm going to get him. And David would go in there sometimes and he would play the harp. And then there was the night or the day when Saul took that javelin and threw at him and tried to kill him. Oh, I'm going to tell you, folks. It seems like when we win a tremendous victory, that fear comes in right behind it. Fear took the form of Jezebel after his victory on top of Mount Carmel. There was Elijah up on that mountaintop. 
and all those false prophets there. And he killed every one of them. A tremendous victory for God. He even called fire down from heaven. <laughs> That's never been done before. I guarantee you that would get your attention, wouldn't it? A tremendous victory that he had just won. But guess what? Ahab, the wicked king, the, the wickedest king Israel ever had. He went and told that ugly, sorry, good-for-nothing wife of his what he had done. Oh, she didn't like that. She didn't like that at all. And she sent word to him. Elijah, I'm coming for you. <laughs> now, you know, it's always good to know what your enemy is capable of doing. And he knew what she was capable of doing. She wore the britches in the palace. Let's just put it that way, okay? <laughs> and she said, I'm coming to get you, Elijah. And what did he do? He fled. After killing all these prophets with the sword, he chickens out against this wicked woman? He sure did. But you know something... It was in that cave when God got the talking to him. Well, what you doing here? <laughs> I'm with you. I'm going to take care of you. And then he prophesied what was going to happen to that old woman. And it happened just like he said. And he was recommissioned. And he done what God had asked him to do. Fear can get into a crowd of people. And start a panic. And it can cause chaos. Like people running from a movie theater. Because somebody hollered fire. Lastly. Fear seems to hinder. Every decision the Hebrew children. Was about to make. Isn't this something? There they were in Egypt. Been there 400 years. And God sent Moses to get them out. Remember all the plagues that God sent down there? He's, he sent them to punish the Egyptians, but he sent them to show the Hebrew children just how powerful their God was. Well, they get out, and they go down to the Red Sea, and fear got a hold of them. They got to the Red Sea. There was no way to go across it. They looked behind them and there was Pharaoh and his army. And this time they was coming for blood. And fear got a hold of them. It began to influence. We need to go back to Egypt. <laughs> Had to be a bunch of Baptists. Scared to death. Wasn't trusting God. He would brought them all the way there. And now he was going to leave them. They couldn't have gone back. You know what would have happened to them if they'd have went back? Those Egyptians who gave them everything they wanted wouldn't be nice to them this time. Oh, no, they'd been mean to them this time. They wouldn't be afraid of them this time. And Pharaoh, oh, he would have got rid of a bunch of them. He especially got rid of Moses. They couldn't go back. They had no choice. But fear got into them. And they completely panic. But you know, God had a cure for that. That old Red Sea parted. And every one of those Hebrew children got to the other side. God's trying to get them home. God's trying to get us home. And then old Pharaoh, he, I mean, I'm going to tell you, folks, Pharaoh just didn't have all his marbles, I don't believe, because I'm going to tell you, after those ten plagues and that Red Sea opened up, uh -uh, I wouldn't have went through it, but he did. They didn't see him no more. You see, fear has a way of gripping us when we panic. And that's what happened to the Hebrews' children. 
Fear can lead you into the wrong direction. And fear has taken a grip over us during this pandemic. It has. How did these saints of God begin to win over their fears? Now, this sounds elementary, but you got to remember we are considered sheep. Sheep, the dumbest animal on the planet. You don't think God's going to make it complicated, do you? If it did, we never would understand nothing. He makes it simple. What do we do when fear grips us? The pandemic, losing a job. Don't know how you're going to make it the next day. You just don't think you can go on because fear has got you. Your heart's broken. You don't know what to do. Here's what these people did. Now, folks, if it worked for them, it'll work for us. I'm just convinced of this. What did they do? Very elementary here. They trusted him. That's not that hard, is it? Trust me. Peter asked him, Lord, if it's you, can I walk out? He said, come. He walked out. Walked on the water. Now, that blew his mind because usually when Peter put his foot in water, he hit sand. But this night he walked and then he began to sink and Jesus reached down with his hand and pulled him up. He trusted him, folks. Peter trusted Jesus' hand to pull him out of water. Elijah learned to trust God's word and was recommissioned. Different generations of Israelites learned to trust God and was free from war. When they trusted God, when they obeyed God, they had peace. And when they didn't, fear came in. You and I must learn to trust God when we sometimes really don't know what God's up to. We got to trust him when we're sick. We got to trust him when we're sad when we're lonely, when we're unsure about things, we got to trust him. We got to trust him when we're young. And we certainly have to trust him when we get old. I'm beginning to find that out a lot now. I'm not a spring chicken anymore. My body's wearing out. But we got to learn to trust him when we're old. We got to learn to trust him when death is near and we know it. We got to learn to trust him. We got to learn to trust him when we walk through the valley. We got to learn to trust him when we own the mountaintop. We got to learn to trust him when fear grips us and don't seem to want to let go. Folks, we got to trust him. And if we'll trust him, then we'll get through whatever we're going through. It may not happen tonight. It may not happen tomorrow. God has his reason why things are delayed sometimes. But we just got to learn to trust him. If you trust him as your savior, why don't you trust him when fear begins to bother you? I don't understand it. He's our Savior as long as everything is going good. But when things are going bad, why don't we still trust him? Can't figure it out. When fear grabs a hold of us, what can we do? Trust him. Very simple. And I'm glad it's simple. Because I can understand it. How about you this morning? What are you facing this morning? Is it finances? Is it, is it our children that we worried over? Our grandchildren? Are we getting older now? And that's where it is. And we know that it's a matter of time before the Lord calls us home. Can you still trust him? Maybe this week somewhere, 
you knelt down and you trusted him as your savior. You just haven't made it public yet. Maybe you knelt down and invited him to come into your life to be your savior. You need to tell somebody. Tell somebody what has happened. And maybe you just need to rededicate your life and trust him more than you've ever trusted him before. God is waiting. The decision is yours. Let us pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the encouragement that is found throughout your book. Lord, you know the condition of everybody's heart that's listening in today. Maybe today, maybe today, that they learned the secret of fear, and that is to trust you. Thank you so much for this opportunity that we have to share the gospel with the world that's going so far in the wrong way. Help our nation to see the light, change, it, change hearts, go with us and guide us until we meet again for these things we ask in Christ's name. Amen.